early 2000s, I was actually a corporate pilot flying a Cessna 414 for a local uh, trailer manufacturing company, and they had a business in Richfield, Utah, and couldn't make it all the way, so we would we would stop in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and we'd stop to get fuel, and, and I saw this Connie uh, sitting out there and um, knew it was, um, or I heard that it was Columbine 2, and I was very intrigued, and I'd walk around it and kind of ooh and ah over it, and at the time, I didn't have the money to uh, put the air in the tires, and uh, that was free. Just needed a compressor. And then I got a phone call from my friend Carl Stolfus, and Carl called me and said, you know, thinking about buying Columbine 2, and it's in uh, Marana, Arizona. He acted like, I mean, he didn't have a clue I even knew. So I actually sent him pictures. I said, yeah, I've been out there and looked at it twice. Have you really? Yeah, I've been out there to look at it. Are you wanting to buy it? No, I'd rather you buy it, Carl. <laughs> I'd just like to have a friend that owns one. I don't necessarily want to own one. So we, we talked a little bit, and, and he went into the negotiations, and, and by gosh, he bought the darn thing. My name is Brian Miklas. Um, I was the project manager on Columbine 2, uh, the Connie that Eisenhower uh, uses his presidential aircraft. Um, it was an amazing project to be on, very thankful and grateful to be able to be part of that project. Probably the highlight of my career, no probably to it, definitely a highlight of my career. I uh, had a bunch of great people helping us, working with us, uh, guys from Dynamic and support from Mid-America Air Museum and Tim Coons and Pete Blood and just, just lots of great guys helping us. And, but just an amazing project to be part of. And, and I like to tell the story about uh, when Carl first approached me with it. And he came up and pulled up in his vehicle and, and showed me a magazine that was talking about the demise of, of Columbine 2. And, and uh, I remember him coming up and saying, you know, what do you think of this? And I kind of flipped through the pages. I'd never really paid any attention to Connie's and, and that kind of stuff. You know, it's just a big airplane. And uh, I, remember, I remember looking at it and saying, yeah, you know, I think that we could take it apart here or, you know, it'll, it'll separate here you know we can haul it home and and him looking at me saying no we're going to fly it home and uh it was just an amazing adventure from that point on it was just pretty incredible and and uh, we headed out to marana and we got out there and i first saw the airplane and my first thought was my gosh this is a big airplane where do you start this thing is just huge and it was probably the end of the first week before carl and i really talked about the airplane because uh, we were both afraid that uh we would both say let's just get back into king air and go back home um, it was just an overwhelming, overwhelming task. But as we got more and more into it, the more it seemed like, okay, it's just another airplane, nuts and bolts, and start working through the systems, and that's how we approached it. And, uh, and it turned out to be a great airplane, great project. I got started with the Connie. Uh, Carl contacted me through a group of friends through Anderson Air Motive and everything, and uh, found out I was in Arizona and I was willing to help. Um, I went out there. I think it was a Wednesday, the first day everybody got there with Carl and Brian and the whole dynamic crew and uh, Tim Coons was with me and we did the first evaluation of the airplane that day. There were a ton of people when we first got there. Uh, it was it was amazing the number of people that, that showed up at Columbine when we showed up to to do our first inspection and, and uh, there was a lot of pressure to run the engines, a lot of pressure. And uh, Carl just kept on, you know, we're gonna run the engines, we're gonna run the engines. And, uh, you know, again, we have very set things on how we do ferry aircraft, how we prepare aircraft for flight. And it became very apparent very quickly that that was not gonna be a quick, easy thing for us to do. And I can still remind, remember riding back to the hotel one evening in a van, and Carl asked me when we were gonna run engines and, and me telling him it's not gonna happen this time. And he was very quiet for a little bit. And then when I went through the list of things that we needed to do to make sure these engines would survive and would be going to be good to go, then he was in full agreement. And, and we didn't run the engines the very first time. And it was several trips after that before we actually ran the engines. And the big thing was is we pulled so many components off and had them sent out, like I say, fuel pumps, uh, just the whole nine yards. Um, really every accessory, uh, probably other than magnetos, we sent out for overhaul. Um, so, so just great. Like I say, great prep. We had every intention of making it successful, and we did just that. Uh, it was overwhelming because, first off, it was a big airplane that's been sitting for a really long time, so it was hard to know where to start. Um, we kind of started looking at the motors over a little bit to see if there was even anything worth running. And um, that first weekend, I think we put fuel on and found out that that wasn't going to work for a while. We put got that fixed, and then 
actually pressured up the engines and that was another thing that everything had to come off, all the systems, all the components. Fuel injection nozzles, fuel injection lines, all the master controls, everything came off and went out for overhaul. And then we started pulling hoses and cleaning tanks and getting engines ready. That's mainly what I was as well. I was the engine guy. I didn't get to touch much of anything else. It was almost nine months. By the time we got all the components out, finding people to overhaul it, getting the stuff back. I mean, I was going down there two or three weekends a month, spending three days with them at a time, doing a fuel. You know, we got the first thing we did is we got the, you know, the fuel injection nozzles done, and then the injection pumps done, and then the lines changed, and the master controls. And once we started getting everything back in, it started going faster. But yeah, it's a lot of work. It it, it took me. It took me almost two and a half days to do just injection nozzles, nozzles on one engine because it's just, you gotta rip everything off, put those in and everything back together. And I said, you know, if you go out there, we'll come help. And so we, uh, we did. Loaded up our Lockheed Lodestar and, and loaded up with mechanics, had almost every seat full and flew out there. And when we got there, his team was really glad to see us. And because I mean, our, our guys were very experienced radial engine guys. And, we got there and then we got to meet Billy Packer, we got to meet uh, Brian Michaelis and got to meet their team and had a lot of, lot of fun, but it was a lot of work. Corrosion actually wasn't a big issue with Columbine 2. Uh, she'd been in the desert for quite a while and it was tremendously kind to her hard parts, to her, to her fuselage, to her airframe. The worst things that we found is all the rubber, all the soft stuff was shot, O-rings and seals and everything. Uh, we went through the entire hydraulic system replace probably 90% or better the seals in the hydraulic system. Every single soft line, uh, fuel hydraulic, no matter what it was, we changed. Um, so that was that was probably the biggest thing that, that sitting out for so long had done to us. Um, and then uh, the hard lines, the hard hydraulic lines from, from sitting and not being properly preserved, uh, we were finding corrosion. And so as we, every time we'd pressurize something, we'd find another leak and, and just, just continue to work through the system and, and fixing those things. And I think we made in total three trips out there. And then I physically helped Carl with some of the uh, accessory overhauls, uh, helped him with the props. And so people thought that I was a financial investor in the airplane. I was not, we, uh, but I did, did help a little bit, but I didn't help nearly as much as I got credit for. And Carl's a very generous man. He, he'll, give, uh, he'll give a lot of credit to people if you help a little bit. Every time we'd run engines, we'd pull screens to check the health of the engines. And we pulled the screens on number four and found that there was a lot of metal in it. So in, in, in aviation terms, it was making metal. Um, and that's not a good thing. So we decided then, rather than it hurt the engine any more than what it was, uh, we would pull the engine and, uh, and we would borrow one from Baton. So we borrowed a uh, number two engine from Baton and uh, we put it on our number four, along with two props that we put on three and four. And, uh, and it worked out really, really well for us. And the reason why we borrowed the props from them is because these are electric props and they are still hollow with, with uh, rubber in the end of them. And ours had actually began to separate. The rubber had started separating in the end of it and it creates a swelling situation and you can't use the prop. So we actually were able, if we weren't able to borrow those props from Baton, we would have been in a world of trouble. Uh, so again, the cooperation between the teams was, was amazing and tremendously beneficial to both groups. The fuel system on Columbine, uh, it, it's, it's a wet wing. And with a wet wing, it means that you don't have a bladder or a tank within the wing. It means that the wing itself is actually the fuel system, the fuel tank. And, and they use PRC and, and things like that to seal all the cracks, all the possible leaking areas. Uh, and over time, with, with it sitting empty, then that PRC can dry up and crack and come away from the, from, the, from the areas that it's supposed to be sealing and create leaks. So that was a huge concern for us as we were moving forward um, with the fuel system. The, the fuel pumps and stuff we had changed, the hoses we had changed, so we knew we were good on all that stuff. Uh, the big question was going to be the first time that we put fuel in, what was going to happen. So that was actually a long process in putting fuel in. We, you know, we put 50 gallons in and wait and make sure nothing's going to run out and then put another 50 gallons in and wait and see what was going to run out. And actually we only had one tank and that was the, I think it was the left inboard tank 
that gave us any problems at all. So, so other than that, it was absolutely amazing the way the fuel system worked out for us. So it turned out really, really well. One of the toughest things uh, in dealing with Columbine was the lack of parts. There's just, just no parts. So you're scrounging, you're begging, you're looking, you're getting very creative. You're doing whatever you have to do to get, to get stuff airworthy and make it correct and, uh, and make it come together. So that was probably one of the biggest challenges in doing the airplane was that, you know, other, other than that, when it, at the end of the day, again, it's just a big girl with lots of pieces and, and uh, you know, it's just another airplane, nuts and bolts, as far as mechanically goes. It's definitely not just another airplane because it's Columbine too. So, uh, so yeah, no, it's, it, it was a good project, amazing project. Pete Blood is absolutely amazing to work with, and the, and the Baton guys, I don't think, or Baton Baton, I don't think uh, with, without both projects going at the same time and without the cooperation and the joint uh, fellowship and just, just the way we came together, the two teams to help one another out with personnel and with materials was absolutely amazing. It would have been tremendously, way, just a lot more difficult uh, if we wouldn't have been able to help each other out. And, and uh, yeah, they actually, they borrowed a propeller from us um, and they borrowed a QVC, a firewall forward. Um, and then we turned around and in turn, we borrowed one and two props from them. So, so again, the, the cooperation between the two groups was absolute and continues still today. Um, it, it, that's developed into a great relationship. And uh, if everybody in aviation was willing to cooperate with one another like that, it would make everybody's life so much easier. <laughs> but yeah, great, great guys, great guys. Really enjoy them. Man, the first test flight, you want to talk about pins and needles and just, I don't know how you can be any more nervous. I mean, I've, I've got four children and, and, and Amy, please forgive me, but <laughs> I don't even think that I was near as nervous and, and, and just just dying inside uh, watching Columbine taxi off and, and, and take off roll and rotating and, and when she climbed out and the gear came up. Um, honestly, it was so emotional. I just, I just, I started crying like a baby. I'm not gonna lie to you. I was, uh, you know, and I'm not the only one. Uh, golly, Nick. That's just, that was amazing. I mean, it was the most beautiful thing you'd ever seen. And, uh, oh my gosh. That just, I mean, there's no words for it. It was, it was amazing. And, uh, golly. And then she just kept flying. And they, and they I think they flew for an hour or so uh, over the airport. Just stayed close, you know, just wanted to check things out and make sure things were looking good. And, uh, and came back in and had a good, you know, good landing. Brakes were great and everything was great. Uh, and really, we had minimum squawks. Um, we had some indication issues, you know, electrical issues with some indicators and whatnot. Uh, but overall, the first flight was amazingly successful, amazingly. Uh, so it was made in very short order then that, that we were going to go ahead and, and head for Bridgewater, uh, just based off of that flight. So, so it progressed very, very quickly after that. Uh, we knew at that point in time it was, gonna, it was coming to Bridgewater, uh, Virginia. So Carl and I have been talking about that. I said, you know, Carl, I really think that's going to be a very epic flight. It's going to be an amazing flight for that airplane. And it's probably not going to fly again. I, we all knew that once it got to Bridge uh, uh, Water, Virginia, it wasn't going to fly for many years because it was going to undergo a restoration. So I think we need to take the B-25 out and document the trip home. And Carl wasn't overly excited about that, and I really didn't care. Uh, I, just, uh, I just knew that I really wanted to do that. I thought it would be really cool. Carl was worried about how much fuel it's going to burn. I said, well, it's going to burn about a, a, a third of what you're going to burn, so, or a quarter. So don't worry about it. You know, they had the airplane, it was looking great. Um, they had it all ready to go. 
um, we did some final help him clean up some things and kind of put some things away, more or less get ready for the trip, um, get it tugged over to the line, you know, and then it's, then it's starting to become reality and you could tell, you know, the, the energy out there was, it was an awesome energy to have. And it was one of those things where if you could have that kind of situation every day, it was just, it was cool. Everybody's, everybody's excited about the trip. You know, everybody's, you know, getting ready. The airplane's ready to go. All everything, the media's starting to show up. Everybody's keeping their, poking their heads in and, and seeing what's going on. Um, you know, all systems were working, you know, the, properly the way they were supposed to. Um, and weather, I mean, weather was looking great, had no issues with weather. So it's, you know, it's the day before and everything's green light and it's, it's, it's getting, you know, it's getting pretty neat and pretty interesting at that time. Just like that, old boy. Man, I wish I could have been here when this thing flew the other day. Oh my gosh. It's beautiful, man. Oh yeah? Oh my gosh, dude. And she got off the ground so quick, it was just, it was crazy. Yeah, in Arkansas would be a case. Oh. Whoa! Our, our, hey, there's a curb. Oh, oh man, I, I almost got you right in the face, didn't I? Hey. <laughs> there goes my masculinity. <laughs> God, I feel like a young man again. Was that it? <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> Yes. It's time to hook Tyson up Navy to the flight. All the way. Oh, you're gonna. Yeah, this is. Uh, <laughs> 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 Ready to go. <laughs> so, okay. All right. <laughs> Exciting day. Did you like my interview? Stand by a second. circles over the airport and watched from above watch Columbine roll and make sure that she got wheels up and everything was in the well and, and we got a green light from them that they're they're good to go everything's running good and we're gonna we're gonna make a turn eastbound um, so we made a turn well they hadn't flown I mean that airplane hadn't, hasn't flown in, in I think it was 10 years and it was a ferry flight 10 years ago um, so it really hadn't flown much so really nobody really knew what it was gonna do uh, and we're how it was going to match up to the B-25. So we picked a speed that we thought was going to be a, a decent speed. And actually we were, we thought that the, we were going to have to give everything the B-25 had to keep up. Um, but the, uh, so we headed out, headed out in our direction and waited for um, the Columbine to catch up to us. Because of the, the engines and trying to make sure that we didn't put any extra stress on the airframe and really, with most photo missions, you know, the camera ship flies a steady, he's gonna fly at this speed, and then who's ever being photoed is they're gonna be, they're gonna maneuver around the camera ship. Well, with this one, we didn't wanna do that. The Columbine was headed to Mount Pleasant, Texas. 
It was going directly there, and we were going to get whatever shots we could get in that four-hour period. So once Columbine got up and they got they got there, everything situated and everything was in cruise. Um, then we started to maneuver the B-25 around Columbine. Um, as a pilot, and you know where we sit, you know we're up in front of the B-25. We don't really have much visibility behind us. So it was really interesting um, with the photographer in back, and he was telling us how far everybody's away, and we're so we're trying to slowly crank off power without seeing. It's kind of like trying to drive a car blindfolded. Um, and it was like, okay, well they're right behind us here, you know. So um, we kept getting a little closer and a little closer, and we got, finally got to a point where Tyson Tyson got some amazing shots out of it. Um, and then we maneuvered maneuvered around them. Columbine flew behind the B-25 for um, yeah, probably about an hour, hour and a half. And we went past, it was passing El Paso. And we made that turn around El Paso. And it was one of those, like, it was, Columbine picked up speed. She got everything, you know, everything, the engine started, everything just smoothed out. And she really, she picked up about uh, 10, 15 knots, I believe. Um, and all of a sudden, she's, she's going to pass us. And it was one of those things where, um, the photographer in the back said they were, you know, they got out and I, I turned around in my seat on the right, I was in the co-pilot seat, turned around and looked out the window and, and you could see the nacelle, it's a real, I have a really cool picture of the B-25 nacelle and you're looking back over the tail and Columbine is just there. Now they're playing along. If you guys aren't getting good shots back there right now. And it's just, just beautiful airplane and in the cost Connie's flying are beautiful they, they just have beautiful lines to them and and here's this airplane and it's creeping up on us and it was just cool I got I got some really cool videos that was a really exciting time to watch it pass by the wing and it's like there it is
But the photographs we got coming back were epic. The video you took and the photographs that Tyson took uh, were, were just some of the most stunning um, pieces of photography I've, I've really ever seen. And it was just a real experience to see that Connie, you know, we were primarily uh, in front for a long time and they, they pulled up behind us and then, the, and then there later on we swapped positions and just to see that massive thing flying through the air, it was, it was, it was quite a, I can remember it like it was yesterday. Glover, uh, born and raised here in Mount Pleasant, Texas, and uh, this is a very, very historic event. Got some people I'd like to introduce to you, but uh, behind you, uh, most of you have read, but uh, this is uh, the original Air Force One. This is the first aircraft ever flown to be designated as Air Force One. It flew for President Eisenhower in 1952 through 1954. It's a Lockheed Constellation. And it's just an amazing piece of American history. The other uh, uh, Air Force One aircraft are actually in the uh, uh, ownership of the United States uh, Air Force, and they're in uh, various museums, and they will they they will never fly again. This one got the got dropped by in the cracks, which is a really good thing because now then we can actually get to enjoy it. Uh, my very good friend, and come up here, Carl. I'd like to introduce to you Carl Stolfer. <laughs> Carl and I have been friends since 2010. We met at an event up in uh, Illinois uh, with some DC-3s. He's got a DC-3 just like ours. He's got uh, Miss Virginia and we've got Sky King here. We met there and uh, and it just we just struck a friendship and it, it's it's just grown and, and and here we go. Carl bought this airplane. It's I have no ownership in it. People have, have, have indicated that. I, that's not the case. This is Carl and his company, Dynamic Aviation, but uh, Mid-America Flight Museum. We certainly support him and what we do. We don't know what's going to happen, uh, but it's going to be restored, and it's going to be shared with a lot of people in the in the years to come. That's, uh, that's what's going to happen. 
But Carl, how about you say a few words to uh, my hometown folks here? I told Carl we were going to even give him a really nice uh, welcome when he landed at Mount Pleasant. He was expecting 20 or 30, 50 people. <laughs> here you go, Carl. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Scott. Uh, up until this point in time, Scott has not had a credibility problem, but he sure does now, because this isn't just a couple of people. <laughs> but in all practical purposes, this is an American, uh, an airplane that belongs to the American public. It is a very, very... As Scott has indicated, it's a very, very uh, historic aircraft, one of the most historic aircraft uh, being able to be flown uh, in front of the public today. And so we look at it as an airplane, and Scott, uh, he'll be certainly modest about it all, but he's certainly helping, uh, has helped us tremendously. Uh, but it's an airplane that we want to get restored to a point to where we can have it, where people can take tours in it. I apologize, we won't be able to do that today. But it's an airplane uh, that eventually we want to have it so uh, people could just go up a pair of steps like this and, and see uh, the seat, the seat, uh, the exact location where President Eisenhower and Mimi Eisenhower sat. They actually had, each had a, a state chair uh, in their stateroom and they could actually turn and turn 90 degrees in the chair and talk to each other. So we have uh, a, lot of, a lot of ability to restore it back to its original colors and decor in the interior and do a lot of work on the outside. So. Uh, so that's a little bit where we are, uh, but you know, having the notion of doing this is just sort of one little part of it. It takes many, many, many people. So uh, the dynamic crew, uh, Brian, where's Brian? Right here. Right there. Right, right here. Right here. Carl. Right here. You're right. Oh, okay. <laughs> Brian, put your hand up. And the di all the rest of the dynamic folks, uh, not dynamic folks, put your hand up. Yeah, these are the folks that spent the better part of the last year traveling back and forth from, from uh, Virginia to Marana, uh, Arizona, to uh, put the airplane back together. It was not in very good condition, and it flew flawlessly in here. Uh, awesome. I'm going to say that until the pilot tells me otherwise. <laughs> but, uh, but, but most importantly is the crew. Uh, where's Lockheed? Oh, Lockheed's right here. And, uh, Tim Coons is right here. Mr. Woodward, where? We got Tim, right got and, Tim, and Tim Coons. Coons. Tim Coons. Where, where are the other guys? Yeah, okay, the other right guys. Here, put your hands up high. Uh, these are the guys that got aboard this airplane last Saturday. It hadn't been flown for 20 years or about 15 years, and uh, did a very, very successful test flight. They got it this morning and flew a four and a half hour nonstop flight from Marana, and th this is the crew that did it. So please give them a big thank you as well. Uh, interestingly enough, Lockie's, Lockie, Lockie Chrysler, the pilot, the captain, uh, his father owned this airplane at one time. So there's kind of an ongoing bit of history there. Now his son, uh, his son is here, uh, Brandon, he's here as well. And I don't know whether he knows it, but we're going to make an aviator out of him too. <laughs> Got this generational thing coming right along here. So um, it just, it's, it's really heartwarming to see this many folks show up uh, and uh, I, ho I hope you enjoy the rest of the afternoon, and thank you, Scott, for so much that you've done to help get us to this point. Can you handle it? Handle it. Okay, camera's ready. All right. Should we shake it really bad? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's pointing my direction. <laughs> point it out and open? Yeah, yeah. Go, Rocco. Are right, you guys ready? Yeah. Don't point at me. <laughs> Each of the crew guys that call and all right, I'm gonna, I'm yeah. gonna, I'm going to be Absolutely. the guy passing them out. Okay, you do that. <laughs> so it's just, just, the crew. just a tiny little How you bit doing? Good, buddy. Good. Yeah, a little bubble. Good. That's it's good. just That's going good. to That's the good. crew, the people who, if you'll call the crew guys up closer. <laughs> well, the next leg, uh, when, we, when we left uh, Mid America here, Mount Pleasant, the rest of the ground crew. Uh, myself, Rocco, uh, Kevin Nelson, we had decided we were going to ride on the Constellation. We didn't care. <laughs> so it was decided. We convinced Carl to let us ride um, from Mount Pleasant to Bridgewater on the Constellation. And uh, man, 
It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. It, it is a very big airplane. But when they got to the end of the runway and they released the brakes and that thing started to accelerate, it set you in the seat. And it was just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Absolutely amazing. And we climbed out and uh, she was just performing just beautifully. Just, just an amazing airplane. And, and, you know, we were up and walking around and watching what was going on and watching up front and taking lots of videos and pictures out the windows, you know, and just enjoying it. Watching the engines and stuff because it, it gave those guys an extra set of eyes also. And uh, so we just... We just really enjoyed the flight home and just could just really appreciate the airplane and and you just sit there and start thinking of the history and everything that was done with the airplane and, and you know, President Eisenhower and all the other folks that had been on that airplane and and here we were, you know, here we were a year later after we started this whole thing, here we are actually riding it uh, to Bridgewater and uh, it was just amazing, just absolutely amazing to see everything that we worked so hard for right there and we were we were in it riding home but i tell you Lockie stuck it right on the numbers and and he it, there was absolutely no issue whatsoever he probably could have made the last turn off if he wanted to um just a tremendous tremendous job and again we got turned around and taxi back and we could see that number two engine was smoking pretty bad uh so we knew we had a couple cylinders that were hurt on that engine on on the flight coming in uh from texas to to bridgewater um and we had actually opened the back door so we could wave to everybody because there were so many people lined up and in the park everywhere. We had opened the back door and there was so much smoke coming into, co into the cabin from that engine that we actually had to put the door back in. Uh, but, but it was still, it, was, it didn't matter. It was, we, we knew we had a hurt engine, but we had a great airplane. She's absolutely beautiful. I would have I changed some cylinders and went anywhere in the world that you wanted to go with her. And I still would today. Um, my son, uh, Tyler, uh, it still gets me. Um, when we came off the airplane, it was really cool to be able to be part of the crew who stepped off the airplane because it was cool to be here and be part of it. Um, but but you know just the air the flight crew stepped off here at Bridgewater, so to be part of the crew that stepped out of the airplane in, Bri in Bridgewater um, was really really cool. And uh, when I got down the steps, my youngest son Tyler he just burst into tears. And he was so afraid of the landing at Bridgewater, and he was so scared um, that we were finally there and safe. It was just overwhelming for him. And, uh, but, but, you know, that's the whole impact. Uh, my family was so proud of me. Everybody was so proud. And again, you're part of history. And, uh, and uh, you don't get to do that every day. You don't get to do that every day. And very few people in their lifetime ever get to say, hey, I was part of something historical. Um, so again, to be part of that is just, uh, it's beyond words. It's beyond words. And, uh, and even though Dynamic owns the airplane, you know, and I've said it before, it's, uh, it's not, uh, you know, Dynamic has become the custodians of that airplane. And it's the people's airplane. It was an Air Force One. It was the first one. Um, the history of this there with Eisenhower makes it very, very unique. You know, I'm surrounded by beautiful uh, warbirds and, and airplanes with a lot of history, and I get to work on them every day. But there's something about Columbine that will always be special. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty unique. <clears throat>